Good morning. The hearing will come to order, and without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. I welcome everyone, especially our witnesses. The history of technology assessment function within the legislative branch is tied to our committee's early history. Beginning in the mid-1960s, the committee then existing subcommittee on science research and development organized a series of hearings on the relationship between science technology and society and the need for Congress to be informed about emerging technology risk. Several years and many hearings and reports later, Congress enacted the Technology Assessment Act of 1972, creating the Office of Technology Assessment. During its 20 years of operation, OTA created 700 reports on the science and technology relevant to issues of importance to Congress. As we all know, the OTA was defunded and disbanded in 1995. My friend and former Republican colleague, Congressman Sherry Bollard, defended the OTA during the debate to defund it. In his remarks, he questioned the wisdom of this ban in OTA, arguing that the public wanted us to do more with less, not do more knowing less. Today, the Science, Space, and Technology Committee has its own expert staff, many of whom have PhDs, to help members of this committee navigate tough science and technology issues. Science Committee staff also serve as a resource for personal offices across the House, and in some case, of the committee, but committee staff are not a replacement for OTA. Our committee and others also rely heavily on expertise at the executive branch agencies and from the entities outside the government, such as the National Academies. But the fact is, much of the information we receive from outside sources come from individuals or organizations with a particular point of view that we must sort through. We also turn to GAO to fill some of our science and technology needs. However, GAO is still far from filling the gap left by the defunding of OTA. In short, since 1995, there has been a single, has not been a single trusted, com comprehensive, and authoritative, authoritative source of science and technology advice for Congress. Since its disbanding, there has been a few persistent champions for bringing back the OTA. In the last couple of years, those few voices have become a chorus with support from both sides of the political spectrum. The reason is clear. With every passing year, scientific and technological issues are becoming more complex and with increasing societal impacts. Absent on OTA, we are often left struggling to make sense of the competing expert opinions, but still having to make policy decisions in this murky context with potentially grave consequences. The alternative is to be paralyzed into inaction, ceding decision-making to the private sector or to other countries, including our adversaries. Today's discussion will cover a range of topics relevant to how Congress receives and uses scientific and technical advice, and these to topics are all important. However, the central question for today's hearing is this. Do we bring back a modernized OTA, or do we provide GAO with additional mandates and resources to fill that gap? My hope is that in addressing this question, we can temporarily set aside questions of what is politically expedient and get to the core arguments weighing in favor and against each option for, for meeting the needs of Congress. In other words, I hope this hearing emulates the practice followed by OTA in providing this committee with the sound policy options while leaving it to Congress to, feel, figure, out, to figure out the politics. While we no longer have a legislative jurisdiction, the 
it is appropriate that 55 years after the first hearing, the Science Committee continues to lead this discussion. I thank the expert witnesses for being here today and I look forward to your testimony. Before I recognize the ranking member Lucas for his opening statement, I'd like to present for the record a letter from the R Street Institute and Lincoln Network regarding this hearing. For the record. Now the committee now recognizes Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson, for holding this hearing today. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss ways to improve the resources available to Congress for science and technology issues. Over the last few years, we've heard that some members of Congress do not believe they have the resources they need to evaluate science and technology issues. In response, the Appropriations Committee has taken a number of steps to address these concerns. First, they've directed the Government Accounting Office to expand its technology assessment capacities. Since 2007, Congress has funded GAO to do this S&T work. At the direction of the appropriators, GAO also stood up a separate science technology assessment and analytics team. I look forward to hearing from Dr. Persons about that effort and the plan to grow that team to meet the needs of Congress. Second, appropriators directed the Congressional Research Service to commission a study by the National Academy of Public Administration to identify gaps in congressional S&T resources and make recommendations. That report was just released a few weeks ago, and I appreciate the thoughtful work the study committee did to understand the needs of Congress and recommend thoughtful solutions. We'll hear more about those recommendations today from a member of the study committee, Mr. McCord. I believe Chairwoman Johnson and I agree that one of our most important jobs as a committee is to serve as a resource on science and technology issues that come before us, not just for our committee members, but for the entire House. We're fortunate to have staff on both sides of the aisle with a variety of expertise in science, engineering, policy, and the law. Our staff provides good counsel, and they also can tap into a wealth of knowledge from outside expertise on subjects ranging from quantum computing to engineering biology. However, I recognize that our staff does not have the capacity to provide the type of support and analysis needed by every member of Congress. So I'm eager to hear more about the resources GAO is providing and NAPA's recommendations on how we can best meet our informational needs. In my time in Congress, I've witnessed committee and member office budgets shrink and our ability to retain and pay staff diminish. I look forward to hearing ideas from our panel about how to attract and retain S&T talent. Also, thoughts on how to communicate to our constituents the importance of Congress being able to have the capacity to fulfill its constitutional duties, particularly when it comes to dealing with the challenges and opportunities of emerging technologies. I'm one of the few members of the committee who was in 1990, well actually I guess the chair and I and Congresswoman uh, Lofgren were members of Congress when the Office of Technology Assessment was defunded and when those functions were later transitioned to GAO and CRS. At the time, many on my side of the aisle saw OTA as a duplicative pro of, of other resources. Many also believed that the office had strayed from its intended purpose of being an unbiased, nonpartisan organization. Over the last few years, there's been a small but passionate contingent of con congressional members and think tank experts who've advocated for restating, restoring OTA. I think there's a tendency to look to the past with rose-colored glasses and that if we just went back to the way things were, everything that's wrong with Congress would be fixed. Well, not everything in Congress worked perfectly when I came here in 1994, and it's certainly not working perfectly now. I acknowledge that. I think there is merit in evaluating what would serve our members best in the 21st century, as we are doing here today. I still believe the U.S. Congress is the best deliberative body in the world. I look forward to a positive, bipartisan discussion today on how to make it better and to best serve the American people. And with that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. If there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce our witnesses. Our first witness is the Honorable Michael McCord. Mr. McCord is the Director of Civil but Military Programs at the Stennis Center for Public Service. 
He also serves as adjunct research staff member at the Institute of Defense Analysis and is a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration. Previously, Mr. McCord served eight years as a U.S. Department of Defense as the Under Secretary of Defense, Comptroller and Chief Financial Officer, and before that as the Principal Deputy Under Secretary for Defense, Comptroller. In these roles, he has advised Secretaries of Defense Gates, Panetta, Hagel, and Carter on all budget, budgetary and financial matters. Our next witness, Ms. Laura Manley. Ms. Manley is inaugural director of the Technology and Public Purpose Project at the Harvard Kennedy School of Belfort Center for Science and International Affairs. In this role, she is responsible for all project research and programs, including societal due diligence assessments for tech investors, emerging tech briefing guides for policymakers and strategies for increasing congressional s and capacity. Previously, Ms. Manley co-founded the Center for Open Data Enterprise, a nonpartisan research organization that works with governments to leverage data for social and economic good. She's also the senior consultant for the World Bank Group and the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs. After Ms. Manley, Dr. Timothy Persons. Dr. Persons is the chief scientist and manager director of the Science Technology Assessment and Analysis Team of the U.S. Government Accountability Office. He also founded GAO's Innovation Lab and directs GAO's science, technology, and engineering portfolio. In these roles, he has led a large interdisciplinary technical team, which has advised Congress and informed legislation on a number of topics, including artificial intelligence, sustainable chemistry, and advanced data analysis, among others. Prior to joining GAO, Dr. Persons served as technical director for the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Agency. Our fourth witness, Dr. Peter Blair. Dr. Blair is executive director of engineering and physical scientists at the National Academy of Sciences, in Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. From 1983 to 1996, Dr. Blair served in several capacities at the Congressional Office of Technology Assessment, concluding as Assistant Director of the Agency and Director of the Industry, Commerce, and International Security Division. He is also author of a book, Congress's Own Think Tank, Learning from the Legacy of the Congressional Office of Technology Assessment. Our witnesses should know that you will have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. When all of you have completed your spoken testimony, we will begin with questions, and each member will have five minutes to question the panel. So we'll start with Mr. McCord. Good morning, uh, Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of this hearing and of the effort to make this institution more informed and effective on science and technology issues. I testify today in my role as a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration and specifically as a member of the five-person panel that analyzed science and technology support to Congress. The Academy is a nonprofit independent organization helping governments at all levels solve the nation's complex public management challenges and like the National Academy of Sciences, we are chartered by Congress. Our report on this was posted on the Academy website on November 14th. As Mr. Lucas noted, this report was prepared for the Congress and at the direction of the Congress in the fiscal year 2019 Legislative Branch Appropriations Bill. I thank the committee for making our full report part of the record of this hearing along with my written statement and for the opportunity to appear before you to discuss our findings and recommendations. As part of our panel's efforts, our staff interviewed over 100 stakeholders. Although they may not agree with our recommendations, we did talk to all of my fellow witnesses at, the, at this table today in conducting our analysis. The accelerating rate of change in science and technology in the 21st century brings enormous benefits and challenges to both individual citizens and to those of you who are responsible for evaluating how these changes impact society as a whole. In this context, Congress needs to improve its capacity to deal with science and technology related issues. You have some resources available to you now. The question is, are they adequate to meet your needs? 
Our task as laid out in the Appropriations Conference Report was first to review the current science and technology resources available within the legislative branch, including GAO and CRS. Next, to assess the potential need to create a separate entity to provide nonpartisan advice on these issues, such as the former Office of Technology Assessment. And then finally, to address whether creating that kind of office would duplicate services already available to you. Our report identified several types of S&T products or services that Congress requires to do its work. They are summarized in the table that is part of my written statement. We then looked at the supply of staff resources available to you and, and assessed whether it was sufficient to meet the demands that we identified. We concluded that current resources are not sufficient and assessed options for filling the gaps that we saw. First, we looked at relying on the existing agencies like GIO and CRS. We also looked at creating a new agency, and finally, we looked at a hybrid approach of building on the existing resources but allowing for some new organization or entity to fill gaps. In assessing these options, we tried to balance how well each option would provide the capabilities that, that are needed to meet your, your, your demands with how difficult it would be to implement and how likely would it be to succeed and be sustainable over the long term. So let me now describe our recommendations, which is the hybrid approach of enhancing existing capabilities and creating a new advisory office. There are sort of two parts of this, of this recommendation. First is, on the, is what I would call the supply side, increasing support resources for Congress, and second is on your ability as an institution to absorb and make use of additional capabilities. So on that first track, increasing the supply of resources available to you, our, recommend, our recommendation is first that CRS should enhance and expand its quick turnaround and consultative services. Second, that GAO should further develop the capability of its science, technology, assessment, and analytics mission team to meet some of the gaps identified in our report, and should separate those STAA experts to the mas maximum extent possible from its audit and oversight functions, which is somewhat of a different culture. Next, Congress should create an office of, of the Congressional s and Advisor, which would focus on efforts to build the absorptive capacity of Congress to include supporting recruiting s and advisors for House and Senate committees with major oversight responsibilities so that you have greater s and expertise in the committees where legislation is being produced. This new office would also be responsible for horizon scanning, which we would envision being communicated to Congress in the form of an annual report and annual testimony by this advisor. Finally, we believe Congress should create a coordinating council to be led by this advisor to limit duplication across this advisor's office, CRS, GAO, et cetera. The second track of our recommendation is improving Congress's ability to absorb greater levels of information about s and policy issues. We believe that's just as important as what resources you ultimately decide to add on the supply side. We believe our recommendations will, will address your needs. That said, we also recommend that Congress conduct a thorough re review to evaluate the performance of these reforms 24 months after implementation so you can adjust where needed. Finally, we recommend that Congress pass legislation to carry out these reforms. Even if you could do these changes by fitting it in existing authorities, we strongly urge you to pass a bill that lays out the course the House and Senate agree on to create that public record and to force the compromise and buy-in from both bodies. I would summarize our approach as first make more use of and enhance the tools already in your workshop. Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer your questions or provide further details. Thank you, Mr. McCoy and Ms. Laura Manley. Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for calling today's hearing and the opportunity to testify. My name is Laura Manley, and I'm the director of the Technology and Public Purpose Project at the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. Our mission is to ensure that emerging technologies are both developed and managed in ways that protect the public good. We conduct research on how to integrate societal impacts like privacy, safety, security, transparency, and inclusion at each step of new technologies development, production, and management. One of the most critical opportunities to ensure new technologies are benefiting the public while harms are minimized is governance through the United States Congress. Eight out of 10 of the largest tech companies in the world are US-based, giving Congress the unique position and power to create thoughtful legislation on these new technologies. While you re represent your constituents in this country, your decisions also have the power to affect billions of people around the world impacted by emerging tech. Therefore, over the past 18 months, we've conducted research on how congressional personal offices and committees identify s and needs, find relevant resources, absorb the salient points, and use that information in the policymaking process. After consulting with over 140 current and former members of Congress, staffers, support agency leaders, lobbyists, civil society experts, and academics, we've uncovered several issues. 
Firstly, much of the debate around solutions to the S&T gap present a false choice between building external support agency expertise and internal capacity efforts. We find that both are needed in order to effectively address the gap for several reasons. One, the S&T demands on Congress vary so widely, neither a single centralized expertise body nor a bol bolstered staff would alone address all issues. Two, even with access to the smartest experts in the world on any given technical topic, personal offices and committees still need internal S&T talent to evaluate what they're told, especially when there are opposing views or opaqueness in how experts arrived at their conclusions. By understanding the day-to-day -day experiences of members of Congress and their staff, we believe there, there are several steps that can be taken on two levels, long-term congressional workforce improvements and near-term actions to address immediate expertise gaps. Therefore, we have the following recommendations. In terms of workforce improvements, Congress should increase budgets to allow both committees and offices to hire additional staff members and pay more competitive salaries, which will help retain the staff they already have. This will ultimately save taxpayer dollars by giving offices and committees the expertise they need to thoughtfully evaluate the effectiveness of S&T spending or recommend other cost-saving actions. Congress should also hire additional staff with STEM backgrounds to increase in-house expertise and capacity. As a current staffer noted, congressional offices often hire from within. Staffers typically start as interns who work their way up over time. In other words, the traditional hiring process is not necessarily designed for subject matter experts with years of scientific training. For near-term actions to address immediate gaps, Congress should strengthen legislative support agencies like the GAO or revive and revamp the OTA. A new or improved legislative support agency provides Congress with immediate benefits as it reevaluates its workforce. Given the time-sensitive nature of emerging tech that need effective legislation now, supporting an S&T expertise body will help provide timely information for a variety of congressional needs, specifically those that requ require comprehensive evaluation of complex technical topics. And lastly, Congress should connect with universities to build more robust pipelines for recruiting STEM talent to serve on Capitol Hill. Improving S&T expertise within the policymaking community is not Congress's responsibility alone. Many STEM students aren't aware that they could be successful policy advisors on Capitol Hill or even what the jobs would entail. Academic institutions should educate STEM students in the policymaking process and roles within government. In conclusion, to truly fix Congress's science and tech problem, it needs to fix staffing problem. More immediate actions like refunding the OTA or enhancing entities like GAO or CRS are extremely valuable pieces of the puzzle, but do not complete the picture. Conversely, only increasing staff salaries and hiring additional STEM talent will not solve the independent expertise gap either. Both are critical supports for each other. They allow Congress to have independent, rigorous assessments of emerging tech while also giving it the in-house expertise and capacity to evaluate requests, advice, and proposed legislation. I acknowledge the challenges of some of these recommendations and the time it may take to make progress. However, to fully address the magnitude of the problems this country faces due to transformational technologies, we need an equally significant change to the way Congress recruits, retains, and absorbs expertise. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify and for holding an important hearing on this topic. I welcome your questions. Thank you, Ms. Manley. Dr. Tim Persons. Yes, Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss GAO's expanding S&T products and services to Congress. As you are aware, rapid developments in S&T are transforming multiple sectors of society from medicine to communication to defense. Such disruptive innovations bring transformative opportunities but also the potential for unintended consequences. The ability of Congress to understand, evaluate, and prepare for such changes in an agile manner is critical if the U.S. is to remain secure, innovative, and globally competitive both now and for generations to come. GAO is approaching a half century of delivering high quality content on S&T topics such as space systems, climate change, cybersecurity, and emerging infectious diseases. We ensure that this work is independent, fact-based, and nonpartisan by applying quality standards that help bring transparency, rigor, and authority to our work. We also apply congressional protocols that were jointly crafted with Congress to ensure that we understand legislative priorities and are responsive to congressional needs. Since 2001, in direct response to congressional direction and priorities, GAO has expanded its S&T portfolio by adding technology assessments, 
best practices guides for engineering project controls, and our new Science and Tech Spotlight series, which are the single page uh, printed explainers of emerging SAT issues uh, that the members have in their packet. We also recently launched our innovation lab led by GAO's first chief data scientist. This team will develop innovative analytic capabilities and explore algorithmic accountability in our era of machine learning. Together, these capabilities support members of Congress and their staffs to carry out their Article I constitutional responsibilities, that is, oversight of federal s and enterprise, insight into key s and topics, and foresight on the potential opportunities and challenges for s and advances. Now, foresight means spotting trends before they become front page news. Our technology assessments provide in-depth, critical analysis of emerging technologies and how they might shape society, the environment, and the economy. We've covered many high-profile issues, some in support of this committee, including AI, sustainable chemistry, and nanomanufacturing. This year, we added policy options to our technology assessments, most recently in our work on irrigated agriculture, to further enhance the usefulness of these products to our congressional clients. And we are increasing the volume and speed of this work with upcoming products on 5G wireless technology, AI and drug discovery and development, deep fake videos, and gene editing. We are also pursuing a content-centric strategy for our s and work so that we can provide such information to members proactively as well as on demand. We also know that our in-house expertise is crucial to successfully producing high-quality, fact-based technical work. Our s and team has now reached over 70 staff, and we plan to grow to 140. Over 90% of our staff have advanced degrees, and these in-house experts include physical, life, and computational scientists, engineers of the major disciplines, and other specialists. In addition, we employ staff with expertise in public policy, social science, economics, and law. The diversity of our staff makes GAO uniquely suited to perform effective s and work for Congress. Finally, for the purpose of rigorous external input and review, we have a network of external experts who help us develop and independently review our s and work from a cross-sectoral perspective. Since 2001, we have maintained a standing contract with the National Academies to help us identify and convene experts for in-depth discussion as part of our technical work. We are also enhancing our relationship with universities and scientific organizations so that we can tap external talent on short notice to meet congressional needs. As s and increasingly dominates and transforms our lives, Congress's need for timely, independent, and fact-based s and information is our team's paramount priority. The NAPA panel recommended that GAO further develop its s and capabilities to help meet congressional needs. Under the leadership of the Comptroller General, we already are doing so and will continue to do so. With our unique access to federal information, our extensive internal and external expertise, and our rigorous quality standards, we can and will rise to the challenge of seeking to meet the s and needs of the 21st Century Congress. Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, and members of the committee, this concludes my prepared statement. Thank you for your attention to these issues and the opportunity to speak here today. I'd be happy to respond to any questions when you are ready. Thank you, Dr. Persons. Dr. Peter Blair. Good morning, Madam Chair, Ranking Member Lucas, members of the committee. Uh, today's subject uh, is a longstanding one with me, uh, shaped both by my current post at the academies and my earlier role um, at the former OTA. So the views I express today are my own based on that experience and not necessarily those of the academies per se, uh, since we haven't addressed the topic in a long time, actually since the 60s, um, although that may be something for you to keep in mind. <laughs> uh, let me say at the outset, the prospect of reinvesting in a dedicated technology assessment capability for con Congress has come before you from time to time in recent years, but it should be abundantly clear that such an investment in a variety of ways, as both the reports you've heard about recommend, uh, is now long overdue. Um, today, Congress uh, draws on many sources of advice, but it created for itself four options, historically, that have as having been used most frequently for science and technology-related issues. The National Research Council, the operating arm of the academies, uh, the CRS, the still authorized but unfunded OTA, 
and more recently adding to the mission of GAO. Now, Congress created each option for a specific purpose, but in the wake of the OTA suspension of operations in 1995, the others assumed some of OTA's function, uh, but to date that assumption has occurred only to a modest degree, even after nearly a quarter of a century. And to illustrate this, I give you three observations. First, following OTA's closure, congressional requests for academy studies doubled but then the next year fell back to uh, its historical trend, most likely because most NRC studies currently are carried out at a different level of policy abstraction uh, context than the efforts of the, that the Congress traditionally commissioned to the OTA. Second, CRS's timely off-the-shelf information remains an essential, essential resource but it hasn't filled and never aspired to fill the analysis gap uh, left by OTA's closure. And finally, as Dr. Persons mentioned, GAO began in 2002, ever so slowly, to develop a technology assessment capability. Uh, it remains a work in progress and there are important challenges to mature that capacity. So the salient question is, at this point, how best to improve Congress's capacity overall uh, in a way that is authoritative, independent, objective, timely, and tuned specifically to Congress's needs as distinct from executive agency needs. The current needs are compelling enough that that investment need not be either or among the options. Rather, the result would be more effective overall as a hybrid, that is, to deploy each organization building on its design strengths and realize additional economies from effective collaboration among them, rather than attempting to reinvent the wheel in any, any one of them. The historical OTA experience has some in producing hundreds of assessments over its 23 years, has some important lessons applicable even today. By the way, you can see all of the 750 assessments uh, just by Googling OTA legacy or in better bookstores in the Washington area, the CD collection is around. <laughs> uh, it's a fascinating read, even today. But let me recap the three lessons. First, OTA drew extensively and broadly on the nation's authoritative technology and other relevant expertise through its panels, contractors, consultants, and through participation in many workshops for each assessment. Also, OTA relied on staff expertise recruited specifically to match the technical and policy needs of each assessment undertaken individually. So far, uh, GAO's assessment involvement of External experts has been modest by comparison, so they have some work to do. But overall, the lesson is, in order to be unassailably credible, it is essential to engage the nation's vast reservoir of authoritative technology and other relevant expertise formally in generating science and technology advice. The second lesson, like the academies, OTA relied on the crucial quality assurance step of rigorous external review of its work, again from authoritative experts and stakeholders across the nation. So far, GAO's review remains dominated by the internal processes with some limited external review. So again, it's on the to-do list uh, for GAO. But the lesson overall is extensive and fully accountable external review is essential to demonstrating credibility that the advice delivered is independent, objective, authoritative, and current. And finally, the third lesson is, third illustrative lesson is uh, OTA's statutory technology assessment board of House and Senate members, informed again by a, a standing council of external experts, commissioned assessments in response to bipartisan leadership requests from committees of jurisdiction, most often from both chambers. Most of the GAO assessments so far have not been undertaken in response to formal requests from the committees of jurisdiction, and none so far 
in response to the bipartisan requests from such committees in both chambers. So the protocols for the balance of GAO's work must be uh, uh, that uh, applied directly to technology assessment needs some augmentation. I didn't mean to pick on GAO solely. <laughs> All the options need modernization. <laughs> GAO's initiative going forward, as you heard from Dr. Person, promises features tuned to today's context and in the direction of the OTA standards I just described, although after 17 years, they have some catching up to do. The NRC also is undergoing a major transformation internally that may yield some important ways of providing authoritative s and advice to the Congress. But since progress towards replicating key features of OTA has been slow, Congress needs to redouble its efforts to develop effective advisory capabilities wherever it resides, both in modernizing a dedicated OTA-like organization as well as enhancing the capacity of existing mechanisms. Moreover, going forward, features, uh, both, both reports mention broader portfolio of activities, products, closer connections with other organizations, enhanced communications capacity, and more collaboration across the agencies. The collaboration feature is particularly important. I think, for example, GAO's well-developed Performance audits, audits augmented by its developing s and capability uh, could be much more effective than OT, an OTA assessment alone in evaluating the management performance of executive agency programs. There are other examples, but they all underscore my principal uh, uh, conclusion, as I noted at the outset, that the overall goal should be to deploy each organization in line with its design strengths and to achieve economies and collaboration across the cylinders of excellence rather than try to reinvent the wheel in any one of them. Thank, thank you, thank Dr. You. Land. Uh, at this point, we began our first round of questions, and the chair will recognize herself for five minutes. Um, we all agree that Congress is not sufficiently equipped to address the many complex s and issues affecting society today and I'd like to go down the line and hear from each of you about the consequences of this deficiency. What is the one issue that Congress has failed to adequately address, either through legislation or oversight, and because of its lack of science and technology capacity? And why should American public care? So I will start with our first witness, Mr. McCord. Uh, thank, thank you, Chairwoman. The, um, the, the consequences, as a number of panelists have said, is, is uh, if we are failing, if, if the Congress is failing to, to be proactive, then, then the private sector, others are setting the agenda for you and, uh, or other nations. So I think that uh, that remark was very apropos. I would personally rank probably climate change is the biggest issue out there in, in the science and technology space, although there are many others from quantum computing and artificial intelligence. Uh, I think, think that climate change probably would be my number one. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think, um, speaking for myself, uh, I would say one of the most pressing concerns is our lack of legislation on any kind of real data privacy rights. Um, I think that's related to how we're addressing some of the social media platforms that are interfering with our elections and that are taking advantage of a lot of people that aren't quite aware of what, what they're viewing and what they're looking at. Thank you very much, Mr. Parson. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Right behind you, Proverbs 29, 18 says, no vision, the people perish. And a lack of vision is one of the key challenges. It leads to errors of omission strategically uh, that result in, I would say, not optimized economic competitiveness, safety, security of the U.S., uh, and, and so on. So I think that's the sort of the consequences of insufficiency I think often uh, would fall in that regard. Uh, I would add to the, uh, the macro issues I think that we're behind on uh, legislatively uh, could involve cybersecurity. It's just such a hard, uh, tough cross-sectoral issue. Uh, even if we have perfect performance from our federal government, which we need on this, it still needs the, our best thinking university industry and so on to solve that hard problem. 
and it's only getting worse with the proliferation of Internet of Things and 5G wireless and so on. So that's just but one, I would say, that uh, there's certainly a lot of things to do. And that's exactly why we actually have a sister team at GAO working on IT and cybersecurity all by itself. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Glenn. I'd say the role of um, science, technology, and innovation as a driver to economic growth and prosperity is where we've fallen short. The, ec the structure of the U.S. economy is changing quickly, and the opportunities for growth and investment in science and technology have to be strategically considered, and I think the Congress can and has to play an important role in that, uh, and to have the capacity to uh, uh, look at the landscape and decide where those investments can be most effective, where regulation can be altered, where um, all kinds of issues associated with empowering that uh, dimension should be considered. That's my vote. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Manley, uh, Congress has a constitutional responsibility to provide a check on the executive branch. However, one of the major consequences of Congress's lack of science and technology capacity is an increased reliance on the expert staff working at executive branch agencies and at, the office of, and at the Office of Science and Technology Policy. I want to try to make myself clear. We have very great respect for the scientists, engineers, and other expert civil servants working across government and value the expertise. But our reliance on them also creates an imbalance that could impede our ability to fully carry out our responsibilities of the legislative branch. Can you talk about this and why we, and why you think that was important to address this in your report? So we, we identified three types of, of resources that Congress relies on for S&T expertise, in, internal resources like committee staff, CRS, GAO, CBO, um, but also external resources and then hybrid resources like fellowships, detailees, and then the media. Um, within external resources, we do reference at the executive branch. And, and while we do believe that it's very important to uh, reach out to experts in other parts of the government. We also think that nothing is necessarily free, if that's the, the, the common phrase that people use. Um, so being able to have independent, um, reviewed analysis from each committee and each personal office, it's really important for, for you to be able to evaluate the priorities based on your offices or your committees. So I think relying on these sources is inherently okay, it's problematic if it's the only source that you're relying on. Thank you very much. My time has expired. Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. McCord, in your testimony, you state that GAO needs to make appropriate changes in its organization and operating policies to accommodate the distinctive features of technology assessments and other for foresight projects. Can you highlight the key things that NAPA thinks GAO needs to do to be successful? Uh, yes, thank you for that question. A couple parts of that. First, our, our perception from the people that we interviewed that the panel and the staff interviewed was that there's maybe not full awareness of GAO's capability given that the STAA office is fairly new. The technology assessment effort is older, uh, but, but the, the new office, so there may be just some lack of awareness on the customer side of what GAO is able to do as, as the capability develops. But we clearly got, as we talked to people, the concern that, that the overall mission of GAO is, is as a performance evaluator, as an auditor, it looks backward, and that this function looks forward, the function we're talking about today, so that the, there was a concern about whether those two cultures uh, can fit perfectly well. Or, and so our recommendation is to try and separate this office a bit from the overall backward-looking, evaluating, auditing, function, partly because of perception of people that you were working with that um, do I want to fully share everything that I'm doing with someone who might come back in an audit later and, and criticize that based on that conversation. That may be fair or unfair to GAO, and, and you know, I'm sure Dr. Persons might want to comment on that, but there's certainly the perception that the kind of openness that you want in scientific endeavors might be 
somewhat of a bad mix with, with you know, the people that are going to come and audit that issue, that same issue. So a separation would be, would be beneficial in our view. What about that, Dr. Persons? Let's, can you address uh, how GAO can, can focus on those kind of uh, recommendations? Yes, sir. Happy to do so, and thanks for the question. Uh, I, I think uh, the NAPA panel and Mr. McCord uh, was pointing to the issue. Essentially, it goes to organizational change and growth. Uh, I'll just point to the fact that uh, GAO really started performance auditing in this uh, program evaluation context really in the 1970s. So it's been decades since that time. That is now our dominant product line, if you will, of work. Uh, it, we were started, of course, as a financial uh, accounting and, and financial auditing and things, but we have greatly expanded our professional services for the Congress. Uh, as our former Comptroller General said, we are world-class professional services organizations that just hap happens to work for the Congress. And so uh, this adds, the technology assessment is a function that adds in and can fit well to our longstanding, uh, again, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, almost uh, half a century of work starting in social science work and so on, but moving forward into uh, with the evolution, especially led by this committee on things in the space program or nuclear issues or what have you. Uh, we've built up expertise, uh, and not just only recently as well, and we believe we can. Uh, so you're, do so it. you're comfortable the, the question of whether an institution with a history of being a, a review group can also uh, be a for, forward focused entity? Yes, sir. So, I, like Mr. McGord was saying, essentially we've been, we are ex post in one sense the, the training in terms of looking at something. It's, we have to be fact-based and so on. We're not about predicting uh, the future uh, as, a, as a rule. However, uh, the ex-ante work, uh, we've been doing technology assessment, as was noted, uh, for almost two decades now. Uh, and uh, we also have a sister uh, institution or entity within GAO now called the Center for Strategic Foresight. Um, and that's just because they're not all just in the tech assessment, because although all tech assessment is foresight, not all foresight is technology and science necessarily, although it's increasingly moving in that way. So there is a recognition of ex ante work and working toward uh, and doing policy analysis in that particular dimension, offering up options to Congress that are, are balanced that we believe we can do. Dr. McCord, your study committee looked at the option of reinstating OTA or something similar and ultimately didn't recommend that option. What were the downsides of trying to bring back the OTA? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, we did not recommend it. Uh, it would be, I think, incorrect to say that we, we oppose it, we, we, the, and the Academy would think it was a terrible idea if Congress did that. But you, you can't help but notice that for 25 years, Congress has chosen not to do that. So the question of whether the support is there to, to go that route and sustain it, you know, that's, that's a serious question for us, the viability of doing something that you've consistently chosen not to do. Um, so that's why we, we believe that if you follow our approach, first of all, you could go that route eventually. We, remember, we talk about creating an advisory office, which is much smaller in sort of scope and, and capability than OTA was, giving GAO and CRS a chance to, to do more, come back and evaluate that. You could always move in that direction if you needed to. But again, uh, you look at the fact that Congress has consistently not found a consensus around reinstating OTA. That, that kind of viability question is part of the equation that we talked about as well as what is desirable. What is desirable would probably be to have you know, 500 or 1,000 people dedicated solely to this, but are you willing to pay that, you know, to, to support that financially and otherwise in Congress? It seems that so far the answer has been no. So that, that bore on our thinking as well. Understood. Yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Ms. Bonamici. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you to our witnesses for bringing your expertise here today. I've served on this uh, Committee on Science, Space, and Technology since I joined Congress in early 2012. I, like most members of Congress, do not have a background in science, although now that we have Dr. Foster, Dr. McNerney, and of course Mr. Kasten with his science backgrounds, um, they, they, they enlighten us. And yes, and, and, and Mr. Baird, of course, Dr. Baird. Um, we know, uh, all of us know that um, the people we represent and our policies and our planet will all benefit when we engage uh, the scientific community in our decision making. We're, we're glad to have so much expertise here on the dais, but uh, the, um, among all of us, we, we need uh, that assistance. We know our 
world is facing the consequences of climate change, as, as Mr. McCord mentioned, extreme weather patterns. We had a hearing yesterday. We know that toxic substances continue to impede access to clean air and clean water, emerging technologies, as Ms. Manley and others mentioned, uh, shifting entire sections of our economy, creating challenges. Uh, we know that peer-reviewed evidence-based science can help inform our decisions. And for more than two decades, the Independent Nonpartisan Office of Technology Assessment provided Congress with that unbiased advice and information. But today, we're facing the consequences of efforts to defund this important resource. I am co-sponsoring Congressman Takano's Office of Technology Assessment Improvement and Enhancement Act to reinstate the OTA and to make it more responsive to the needs of Congress, where we won't be able to solve our nation's most challenging problems without the expertise of scientists. So I'm glad we're having this hearing today. And I wanted to follow up on ranking member Lucas's question. Mr. McCord, you mentioned in your testimony that Congress directed the Congressional Research Service to engage with the National Academy of Public Administration to produce a report to study science and technology policy resources for the legislative branch. And specifically, the conference report states stated that the study should assess the potential need within the legislative branch to create a separate entity charged with the mission of providing nonpartisan advice on the issues of science and technology. And as you indicated, the NAPA report suggests that Congress should provide CRS and GAO with the resources and authority to address the gaps in science and technology advice, which is inconsistent with the directive to assess the potential to create a separate entity. Now, it's my understanding that in conversations with our committee staff, the NAPA study team disclosed that it did not give full consideration to the need for a renewed Office of Technology Assessment and instead assumed that the GAO would perform those activities. Is that your understanding as well? Uh, Congressman, uh, woman, I, I would not say we didn't assess it. I, I would say we f it's difficult to assess something that hasn't existed for 25 years and compare it to things like Dr. Person's unit that exist today. That, that, I would agree, is a challenge. We did look at both options. And as I said, we recommended that, that uh, we start with building the thing off the things that exist today. So it's a quicker way to get there, in our view. You could ultimately, as I, as I said to Mr. Lucas, you could ultimately move in the direction of going to a full OTA if you found that our approach was insufficient. I think it's easier to start with our approach and build that way if you feel you need to than to try to build the, the grand structure and possibly struggle and you know for several years and maybe not yeah. get there. And, and but, I appreciate that it was difficult, but I know yeah. you're up to the task. In your opinion, does the NAPA report provide Congress with a comprehensive analysis of the options for independent scientific advice if it does not address the renewal of OTA? Well, again, I think we did, it. We did assess that topic as well. But our, our mission from the report was to look at the questions Congress posed, as you said, and so it was not quite the clean sheet of paper that some of the other panelists here might have. So I wouldn't be surprised that we have different conclusions. The, to me, the salient point is that everybody on this panel, I think, agrees that we need to do better, that Congress needs more capabilities. But also, a, a big point with, with NAPA was that uh, we felt that creating a lot more capability only works if you have time to absorb it. Uh, so the one thing that nobody on this panel, no organization could do is create more time in your day. Wh so, which we so would very much appreciate. Something, <laughs> ha something, has, I mean, some, something has to change on your end as well, Understood. rather than just build something that you don't have time Understood. to read. And, uh, Dr. Blair, in your testimony, you discuss how the uh, NRC, CRS, and GAO have assumed functions of the OTA. Sorry for all the acronyms, but I know you, you're with me. Mm -hmm. um, the assumed functions of the OTA since 1995. In light of the limited resources these entities currently have, and given that GAO has not fully implemented its technology assessment plan, do you agree with the NAPA study team's decision to assume that the GAO would perform all of the technology assessment work? And what value could a reinstated OTA bring to Congress if the structure were more responsive to our, our policymaking needs? Well, I think there are several paths to the future. I think that, um, um, as I mentioned, the, the best path is to use the template that existed for OTA, that is, as an independent, um, dedicated technology assessment organization. Um, and I think that, uh, uh, as, as I think I mentioned at the outset, it is still authorized and, and all of the uh, work practices were there. They have to be modernized, just like all of the options uh, that we've discussed today. But I'm not sure I would dismiss it because it hasn't been addressed in, in so long. The, 
uh, there, the, uh, the OTA experiment uh, went on for 23 years and it had a pretty good track record and I think it's, it's worthy of a serious consideration for a complete look at that. Thank you, and I see my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Mr. Posey. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, for holding this hearing and the options to improve science and technology advice for Congress. Uh, from 1972 to 1995, Congress had an agency called the Office of Technology Assessment, the OTA, the purpose of our hearing here. Its objective was to provide Congress with objective and authoritative analysis of scientific and technical issues. But as we've heard discussed, it was abolished because it was duplicative and a wasteful uh, use of taxpayer dollars. It uh, also strayed from its nonpartisan origins, I understand, and, and published biased studies. The OTA published a background paper in 1984 on our nation's missile defense system in space, and in a Heritage Foundation report entitled Reassessing the Office of Technology, it stated regarding the missile defense paper that there are reasonable grounds to conclude that the OTA background paper compromised the national security by revealing information relating to the national defense. Uh, due to the OTA being a congressional entity, as the uh, ranking member previously pointed out, it was nearly impossible uh, to hold them accountable. Uh, the OTA's lack of accountability, partisanship, and national security concerns led to its demise. And so uh, we're here today uh, because uh, some members of Congress have demonstrated a propensity to leak sensitive information, and the uh, history of the OTA in dealing with national security issues uh, makes many wonder about the reasonableness of reestablishing it. Uh, you know, does the GAO have a secure structure in place uh, for handling sensitive or classified information? And has the sensitive information ever been compromised? As with the OTA uh, paper on missile defense in space, and the question is for Mr. Parsons. Short answer, yes, sir, we do. We have all uh, our apparatus to handle classified information, even up to the top secret and SCI um, uh, level. Thank you. Uh, do you do you see any way that DOJ would um, uh, help uh, your agency uh, with information? I'm sorry, the question is, would the o uh, a hypothesized revive OTA help GAO? Yeah. Yeah, would it be of any any value to the GAO? Well, I think it would be, uh, if a revi uh, revive OTA uh, were in place, it would be one of our sister agencies that we would coordinate with so that we don't duplicate work. Uh, I think one thing that I think all parties uh, are agreeable here, uh, I'm not going on a limb, is that there's a lot of science and technology work to do. Uh, and so I think uh, we would coordinate with them in the same way that GAO's protocols at the start of every study uh, interact or, or check with CRS and CBO at the moment. If an OTA were back, and we did this decades ago when OTA was there, we would coordinate with them on that. Do, do you think money would be better spent um, bolstering the GAO or uh, reinstating an OTA? So, our, sir, our policy, if, if the Congress wills, we, are, we already are growing into, as I mentioned, uh, our uh, aspirational target number is 140 FTE. Uh, that is uh, comparable to what uh, OTA's uh, FTE count was at its shuttering, as far as, I, uh, as, far as we understand it. Um, uh, it depends, sir, if it's a zero-sum game, if, if, it's, if you pay this uh, entity versus GAO, that's, that's the delicate issue. Uh, we do think, again, there's plenty of work to do, even with an OTA, and it's GAO's official policy that we would help support and coordinate with any hypothesized stand-up of OTA. However, if the question is whether or not we are willing, able to do this, I think the short answer is yes. Uh, it's, yeah, no, it's, it takes a pretty compelling argument to get uh, most of the people in my district to think it's a good idea to start another government agency which failed before and is doing a job done by other government agencies presently. Right. But I, I thank you for your comments, and I see my time's about to expire, and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Foster. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you uh, to our uh, Ranking Member Lucas and, um, and the panelists. Um, I, uh, well, I, first off, I want to thank the committee leadership for holding this hearing today on this important topic. I've long been a champion of bolstering the science and technology capacity of Congress from both members and staff. I've been a longtime advocate of the reinstatement of the OTA as a bipartisan independent source of sound technical and scientific analysis, and I've raised this issue, as many of my colleagues know, many times in this committee. I'm proud that we successfully pushed for $6 million funding to restore the OTA in the House FY20 Ledge Branch Appropriations Bill. And while we've been waiting on a final appropriations agreement, I, alongside with my colleagues, Representative Takano in the House and Senators Tillis and Hirono in the Senate, introduced the Bipartisan and Bicameral OTA Improvement and Enhancement Act to strengthen the office's ability to serve the growing need for technology expertise in Congress. This act modernizes and strengthens the OTA by enabling any member to request a technology assessment to be considered by the Technology Advisory Board, adding a Congressional Research Service styled deliverables uh, to the office's function and duties such as providing briefings and formal conversations uh, technical and technical assistance to members on science and technology issues without the need uh, for board review requiring preliminary findings of, of ongoing technology assessments in addition to completed analysis. Um, uh, also requiring final reports to be made publicly available whenever possible, uh, and introducing a rotator program to hire experts from academia and industry modeled after the rotator program at the National Science Foundation, and finally directing the office to be as open and transparent with members about the request review process as possible. I have tremendous uh, respect for the work that's done at the JAO, but it is a common a common source of frustration about uh, members with not a lot of seniority in this operation that you you have to because of the manpower restrictions um, prioritize uh, and very often that means that requests by members without seniority um, you unfortunately have to prioritize off the list of things you actually work on and that uh, because you know the the good ideas in this body come from members of all different levels of seniority and unfortunately you're, you're not able to respond more to that. You know, I, one of the reasons I, I believe that uh, uh, restoring and enhancing the OTA is important is that we, this problem is so important that um, we need an all of the above approach, frankly, on this thing. Uh, I share uh, Mr. McCord's uh, worries about the political uh, viability of this. Um, there is a, um, you know, it was it was sort of a sad situation. You know, back I guess in the 1980s, when uh, when for the first time uh, you saw scientific fact become a partisan issue. I think there's probably no clearer example than the one that was raised earlier with the uh, with the Star Wars, Ronald Reagan's dream of an impervious missile defense. Uh, somewhere on those pile of CDs is the OTA report. Um, it was it escaped a lot of members' notice, but we we quietly this summer killed the EKV, the Enhanced Kill Vehicle, uh, the latest incarnation of Ronald Reagan, Reagan's unworkable dream of having an impervious missile defense system. And if Congress had been paying attention, even reading that ancient CD uh, from almost 40 years ago now, uh, we would have saved tens of billions of dollars. We've now spent more in absolute dollars on the missile defense program than we spent in absolute dollars on the Apollo program. And we've gotten a system that we've had to cancel again and again and again, uh, despite claims that it's, and, and so this is the problem, that the scientific reality is that these kind of systems, mid-course interceptors, just cannot work for fundamental physics reasons. And if you make that correct scientific point, it is, it is interpreted as a partisan political point. Uh, you get into similar discussions with climate change. And uh, so this is, this is one of the reasons why uh, uh, Mr. McCord is right. We have to be very careful that this is going to be political, um, you know, this is going to be politically viable because there are real risks that, um, that one party or the other will get very angry when it's pointed out that their dreams are not reality. And that's the value of this. You know, if you think of if Congress had paid attention to what the OTA said back then, you know, what that $25 billion could have done in science policy, you know, over the course of the last 40 years, uh, it's sort of breathtaking. And there, there are other examples of the OTA's output. Um, anyway, I'd like to also uh, 
uh, enter into the record here um, a, a report uh, of an evaluation of the Napa report, a reaction to it. It wasn't um, that really, you know, points out, I think, things that have already been pointed out. Um, and so without objection, I'd like to enter that without in. Without objection. Uh, to the record. That, that really, I think, you know, highlights. You, you were given a charge which, which didn't give you the, the clear, uh, clear chalkboard to, to come up with a complete plan on. Anyway, I just want to thank uh, the chair and all the witnesses for their engagement in this. And I'll, I'll close with one last thing, the Belfer Center. I was uh, very, very pleased. Uh, Ash Carter invited me to go to a, a, a workshop, you have workshop or a discussion on this very issue in the Belfer Center and the level of engagement of that uh, of that organization toward what they see as a key shortcoming in Congress is something that I just want to applaud. So thank you all. Thank Feel you, better. Mr. Baird. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank all the witnesses for being here today. We appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. Uh, but Mr. McCord, when you, our study committee, was looking back at the Office of Technology Assessment, uh, were you able to interview folks to find out how the office did or did not serve the members, the needs of the members? And then in that same vein, um, can you share some of those findings and what the lessons learned were that that influenced the decision not to reinstate the OTA? Uh, Congressman, yes, I, we interviewed, I believe it's about 127 people, including those you know familiar with the old OTA, but our, our task was not to evaluate whether OTA, when it existed, was, was as good as it should have been, should be brought back exactly as it was. We were, we were operating, you know, in here and now. So although looking back at OTA was part of what we did, it was not, it was not the focus, I guess, of, of our task from the Appropriations Conference. So I would not want to represent our report as, the, as authoritative on, on whether OTA succeeded or failed in its time. Uh, that's really not what we were looking at. We were just trying to look at what would happen, you know, what are the options before us today, and again, trying to make some judgments partly on, on what, are, what are, is this body and the other body willing to do, given the history of, of uh, relative inaction on this subject. So, Dr. Blair, uh, uh, Dr. Persons testified that GAO uses the National Academies as a, as a resource. Uh, can you talk about how the GAO and the National Academies are coordinating and how you think the GAO could better utilize the academies as it expends its uh, or expands its science and technology work? I think the, um, I don't remember when the contract started. It was quite a while 2001. ago. 2001. It was a, uh, it was an illustration, I think, of the collaboration that is essential for success in the future of how this family of organizations can get more out of the collection than just the sum of the parts. That particular contract is to, uh, to use the uh, Academy's Rolodex, if you will, <laughs> to uh, identify the best and brightest minds, technical minds principally, associated with uh, uh, an assessment on the table, and that that group of experts then can be used both to uh, um, inform the assessment ongoing at GIO and to be a source of some degree of external review as the process as the assessment goes forward. So I have one more question for you then, uh, along that same vein. The National Academies of Science were created in 1863 by a congressional charter. Yes. That was, that was approved, approved by President Lincoln. And they were tasked with serving as an advisor to the federal government on science and technology. Do you have any recommendations for how Congress can better utilize the National Academies? And do you have any recommendations for how the National Academies can better serve Congress? That's a very good question. I think uh, I might mentioned that right now the academies is undergoing a transformation. The, uh, uh, the National Research Council, the, uh, the operating arm, is undergoing a transformation to examine ways, better ways, that it can advise both the executive branch and the Congress. I think many of the things that uh, are addressed in both of the reports, such as uh, producing shorter, more timely reports, 
being able to provide information while uh, an academy study is ongoing, uh, and all kinds of different modalities for being able to advise the Congress uh, are certainly being considered as we go along. At the same time, uh, Congress needs to uh, be a receptor to the, uh, to the uh, advice provided by the academies to figure out where it best fits. Um, and I think uh, co continued conversations like we're having with this committee uh, will very much uh, uh, provide opportunities for improving that impedance match going forward. Madam Chair, I'm out of time, but I think Dr. Persons would like to say something. Is that okay if we go on? Just a quick response, thank you. Just to, from the GAO answer to how we're coordinating with the National Academies, as Dr. Blair noted, 2001, we started our standing contract. We use it on a broad array of technical work. By the way, it's important that GAO has precisely defined t technology assessment in a particular product line way, right? Whereas I believe there's an apples oranges risk here where it's essentially everything OTA did is really science and technology policy when you really think about it from an oversight, insight, foresight process. So on many of our reports, including our oversight things, when they're particularly technical, like our antibiotic resistance report or superbug that's about to come out, emerging infectious disease work, that sort of thing, uh, we routinely engage with them early on through the design and life cycle process and review toward the end. Secondly, what we're doing is also now uh, doing partnered work. Uh, we're about to issue a jointly branded report with the National Academy of Medicine on artificial intelligence and in healthcare for drug discovery and development. And so that's one of a series. There'll be others that are coming on diagnostic medicine as well as delivery of care, but that's that piece. And then thirdly, based upon the sustainable chemistry work that we did for this committee uh, and that informed the SCRD, the Sustainable Chemistry Research Development Act, out of this committee, we are also looking at and uh, building a partnership with a different board in the National Academies on how to uh, estimate or comp compute the economic impact or GDP on chemistry on the whole economy, which has not been done yet. So we're proud to be partnered where we are. They're, they've been a key partnership with us and we do extensive work with them. Thank you. Thank you and I yield back. Thank you very much. Mr. Baer. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. Ms. Manley, um, I really appreciate your addressing the elephant in the room, which is the need for additional congressional resources for staff capacity. Uh, underlined in your report, congressional staffers are overworked and underpaid. They tend to come from liberal arts backgrounds, uh, extremely broad portfolios. Even in our small office, I'm trying to figure out when the portfolios are so broad, you know, who, who's going to do what? And I, I would argue that we have to have a dual fold approach, and, and one of them is a lot more resources for the congressional offices. So I was really glad to see the Belfer Center report address this. Um, and this is due to the low MRAs, the, the resources that we have, and the fact that so often our folks are interns. I think virtually every one in my office, except the chief, started as an intern. Um, the, the wonderful young woman behind me was our best intern, so we hired her, and, and on you go. Um, and as a result, I mean, we, we look and see that, you know, we have had no COLA for 15 years. Uh, there's no housing allowance, so some significant percentage of members of Congress sleep on their couches in their own office. So you say it's a simple um, solution to raise members' personal office budgets, remove the capital office personnel, and increase the staff base only. So I want to get to the simple part of that. <laughs> we're, we're the politicians up here, and we've not been able to figure out how to do that. What's the perspective from the Belfer Center? I don't, we, I don't think we have a, a special formula for doing that, and we do acknowledge that this would take a long time, and it's a politically difficult task. But a lot of this conversation, even in today's hearing, has been about either reinstating the OTA or bolstering other agencies like CRS and GAO. And, and frankly, I, I personally think that, that both of these options are good things, but even if we reinstate the OTA and we continue on building up GAO, if we don't have better staff in offices, you might not be able to absorb the information in the first place. So again, I don't have a, a silver bullet answer on how to address making this possible, but I think making the case that even if you do move forward with these other options, if you don't address the root problems, then it really won't make a difference in the long run. Yeah. One of the other things, I'm, I'm used to running a business where everyone stays for 25 years, and it's been really difficult to understand that 
the, the wonderful young people with beautiful educations that I hire, I can count on for maybe 18 months because they're so underpaid, they have to go do something else. They've got to go to law school or Kennedy School or the like. So um, well, there is a committee on modernization. We need to continue to take this to them. They've come out on a bipartisan way and said we need, we need a new OTA, but we also need to really invest in our own people. I also think some of the great breakthroughs that my office has had when we had scientists from the EPA uh, two different years. So we actually had science just that we weren't paying for um, that, that helped us really advance causes and develop good legislation. Um, Dr. Blair, you, you recommended that Congress uh, enact new authorizing legislation, blah, 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 but also to provide for a deliberative hearing process and congressional debate. Um, how do you see that different from what we have right now? Um, what, what would that enhancement be? And I say this with the perspective of it, floor time is so desperately scarce in this place right now. Uh, I'm not sure I fully. The, the, you mean you mean the broader scope of technology assessment as it uh, to inform the decision making process, or do you mean replacing hearings? I'm not quite following. Uh, I'm not sure. This was in the the, the panel recommendation. Um, I, oh no, that. Uh, well, maybe I'm addressing it to the wrong that's person. That's probably so. uh, probably. Uh, the NAPA report. Oh, the NAPA report. So, <laughs> so Mr. McCord, did, did you have a different idea, though, about uh, a del deliberative hearing process, congressional floor debate? Well, I think as it affects science. And Thank you. Mr. Mr. First of all, I would say I, I, I would uh, agree completely with, uh, with what uh, Professor Manley's report said about the problems, the uh, and your observations about about uh, staff being overworked, underpaid, and not having you do have to put more money against this, and all the options on the table, as I think uh, Professor Manley observed, all the options are going to cost money somewhere. Whether you enhance OTA and enhance add any more billets at, at GAO, but without without your ability to absorb more, yes, I, I think that that would be an issue. Uh, that you're, you're going to underperform on your investments in creating s supply of new capability if you don't increase your ability to absorb it. So we, we agree with a lot of the diagnosis that uh, the Belfer Center has in its report about, about how we got to this place and, and to the comments you've made, too, about basically a self-imposed salary cap for understandable reasons. Staff can't make more than you do. You, you, you know, members have not r r raised their own pay. So that is clearly part of the issue. Uh, but as I said also in, in response to, uh, to a previous question, no one, no one, no, no amount of resources, financial resources, can create more time for you. And you, you observe that hearing time, floor time, you know, can be a challenge, and, and floor time is not under any one committee's control. But if no more time is devoted to these issues, then, then we're, it's hard to see how you're going to advance the public interest in the way that I think everybody in the room would like to see. So. You have to find time, and your members have to find time in their day to uh, understand these issues. You have to be able to afford staff that can get you this quality information. Uh, so, yes, that, that's what I would call sort of the the uh, you know the su the supply side, the supply of your time and your resources, as well as is is very important in this matter. Great, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Babin. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, expert witness, for, uh, for being here. Uh, Dr. Persons, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions, if you don't mind. I, I want to thank you uh, very much for your service, and thank you for GAO's uh, excellent service. Do a, do a fantastic job. We, we really appreciate that. Uh, as, you've, as we've heard today, the National Academy of Public Administration report recommends that Congress should not stand up an OTA, like an uh, entity within the legislative branch, but instead should provide the Government Accountability Office and the Congressional Research Service with the authority and resources to build their, their science and technology capacity. Do you agree that this would be a better use of taxpayer uh, money uh, in our country? And uh, are there any authorities that GAO is currently lacking that is impeding it from building up its science and technology capacity? So thank you. Uh, first of all, let me return the thank. Thanks, Mr. Babin, for the question, for You're the welcome. compliment as well. Uh, we have an extraordinary staff that we've built in, in doing uh, very important work, so appreciate that. 
Uh, in terms of our, um, our, our view on, on the capabilities of the capacity, uh, we don't um, have an official position on whether or not we can do everything that's, that's at, but we, we do believe we can do uh, a good deal of the oversight, insight, foresight umbrella of work that we believe Congress has. We believe we're uniquely positioned to be able to just, uh, the burden for Congress is but to ask the questions that may pertain to science to technology, and then we can work inversely to solve that and provide that in that case. Absolutely. I, I think it's significant, sir, that uh, you have both Belfer and Napa independently came from this from an absorptive uh, conclusion as well. I thought that was a very important, uh, I was impressed with the studies in terms of the quality and what they were doing, and I think when you look at uh, where they came out, that, that particular piece is important because as one, uh, in addition to Dr. Blair, I have other senior former OTA officials, some of which said, you know, U.S. Congress is the most advised body in the world. So uh, having more input is not necessarily, I think, uh, the key challenge, although we always want quality of input and filtering and selecting. So I think okay. that's, that's, um, that's where we are on that. Great. And, and then what I most appreciate about GAO is the trusted, nonpartisan information that it provides on the performance of federal programs. And so I, I would ask you this, how does GAO ensure that it produces fact-based information that meets those rigorous standards? Yes, sir. So we, you can't get a report out of GAO if it's not all about the facts and what's provable, what's documented, and so on. Uh, we have the government uh, auditing standards that have been around uh, for, de we, for decades. We literally wrote the book. We're nearly a century old as an institution having done that. Uh, a lot of that, the, what we call the yellow book, is essentially uh, the scientific method in accountancy language. Uh, did you get the right data? Is it fact-based? Uh, are you getting balance in your inputs? Do you have an independent quality check? Are you communicating the results properly? And, and so on. And so uh, in that case, it's ideal. It really is uh, a lot of it in the scientific method. Then we're also doing the, uh, as we mentioned already, the National Academies uh, partnership, particularly when it's technical work, to help expand and reach out to. And then, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, we're building those networks into universities and scientific organizations uh, to be able to get the best uh, and brightest. On tech assessment, we just yesterday issued a design handbook to go out for a year uh, review and comment to help us with large public input to, to be accountable to what is good TA, what are the outcomes of TA, which I think is what the conversation needs to be about in terms of fitting in the absorptive side of things, and how do we vouch for uh, quality TA, okay. which this is an augmentation of or an apparatus to help work under our quality assurance framework to guarantee, sir, what, yes, what the sir. Congress needs. Thank you. Uh, just uh, uh, curiously, uh, how, how, just how many member of Congress requests for information uh, does GAO get? Well, we report, we issue hundreds of reports a year, and then so I would uh, say we at least get as as many of those, whether it's phone calls, uh, table side briefings. Uh, I recently did a round table with uh, a different House committee just on electronic health records and what blockchain or digital le ledger technology may mean for that, uh, in addition to hearings and so on. So uh, extensive. I, I, it's extensive. extensive, okay. And I do want to just, I, Dr. Blair is a friend of mine. He's been keeping us accountable ourselves. It is our middle name on this, but I, we do disagree with the idea that we are not relevant to committees. Uh, on page 13 of my testimony statement, we have nearly a dozen different uh, committees, including House Science, in this case, that request our work and that are absorbing and, and things like that. So we are tied in intimately through our congressional protocols to a broad array uh, of, of members and committees and staff and so on. So we are uh, in the position to be in an on-demand, on-call, if you just need to ask a question, even if it's a quick, can you tell me what 5G is all about, for example, then we're happy to come and do that. Uh, that, that, that is very good, uh, good information, and I really uh, appreciate that. I just think we need to make sure that, uh, that, that Congress is always getting trusted, nonpartisan information that is being requested. So I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. McNerney. Well, I think the chair, and I thank the witnesses for your work. And I really do appreciate it and, and see the need for it. Uh, Dr. Parsons, how much would it cost for the GAO to grow its uh, SDA team uh, to 140 staff as laid out in the uh, GAO plan? 
Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Munari. Thanks for the, the um, thanks as well, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, at 70 FTE, we're estimating approximately 15 million for, for that, so a doubling of that would be uh, the, the approximate number in terms of FTE count. Uh, that's for the, the federal staff that would be on to be able to provide that nonpartisan independence uh, in, in, in keeping with our agency, uh, but we also could have resources to um, uh, tap into external expertise, so there's uh, expenses at times to reach out and pay for uh, uh, convening of experts and so on through national academies or others, uh, and we're also um, uh, updating our the, the flexibility of our hiring process and so on uh, in terms of getting bringing you know, bring folks under, for example, the Intergovernmental Personnel Mobility Act or the IPAs, which other uh, agencies also use to bring in scientific but term limited staff for a time to augment. The permanent staff. So the thirty million dollars that you aimed at—that's that doesn't—that's just personnel. That doesn't include outside activities. Any hypothesized outside? That's correct. So thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Barry. What was the OTA's budget at the time it was defunded? Twenty-five. Twenty-five million. Okay, and that's about thirty-seven million dollars in today's budget. Today's dollars. Sounds about right. Thank you, uh, Mr. McCord. Uh, how did the uh, Napa study team incorporate the operating cost of an enhanced GAO versus a renewed OTA in its analysis? Uh, Congressman, we were not asked to, to do a cost-benefit analysis of whether you know, a marginal dollar would be better here or there. We were looking really more at the capability. Um, we did not advocate a specific number of people that, that GAO should add, so w therefore there was not a price tag on 10 more people or 100 more people at GAO versus our op versus the office uh, that we recommend. The, we recommend a fairly small amount for the advisory office of only in the 5 to 10 million range. Um, I think our main point with respect to GAO was that, again, that the the TA, the TA effort is, is 17 years old, 18 years old, the, but the, the new office is relatively new, I think, only within the last year, so that we believe it should be given a chance to do more, but we didn't, we didn't price out how much you know, you might be willing to spend to let, them, to let them do a little more and add more capability. That would be one of the many decisions uh, that you face in terms of how much you as a body and, and, the, and the other body as well are willing to pay for more capability, which everybody seems to agree that we need. Thank you. Uh, again, Dr. Blair, the consensus studies uh, produced by the academies are the gold standard for evidence-based uh, advice and have directly informed the work of this committee. Thank you. Uh, the Napa study team determined that the academy's consensus model is not well suited for assessing policy options. Uh, do you agree with that? Uh, to a degree. I mean, the, the, by far the bulk of what we are asked to do at the academies are more narrowly prescribed studies. That is, you come to us for an authoritative view on what to do. When there are uh, deep ideological differences or policy differences, then the model, uh, such as the old OTA model, of articulating completely the consequences of alternative pathways without recommending a particular uh, course of action is something we don't do very often. We could do it more, particularly if, we ask, if we're asked in those terms, but historically, by far, the bulk of our work is to, to have an authoritative com committee come in and ask those, uh, uh, produce a report that uh, provides an authoritative view on where we should go, usually in a somewhat more narrowly defined topic than a broad topic like the future of biotechnology or quantum computing or something like artificial that. intelligence. Yeah, or artificial intelligence. <laughs> Ms. Manley, I was uh, intrigued by your study, uh, a former member. So, uh, what led you to take that approach, and do you think that that was as informative as other approaches might be? Uh, our approach was driven by our interest to understand the, the lived experience of members and their staff specifically. We didn't set out to determine whether or not reinstating the OTA or reinvesting in support agencies was one way or the other. Um, we actually didn't go in with any kind of uh, hypothesis on what our findings were. We just wanted to understand what the experience was, and, and these are our findings. So that was the basically the focus. What is the experience of these? Um former members give you. What's driving the gap, yes. Sure, thanks. All right, I yield back, Mr. Chairman.
Thank you very much, Mr. Cloud. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good morning. Thanks for being here. And uh, look, look forward to the conversation. Appreciate the input that you're giving. Um, of course, we do have many fa challenges facing our nation. You mentioned a few of them. One that was not mentioned that is of primary concern and one of the biggest challenges to our nation, of course, is our national debt and the fiscal issues. Um, you know, this program was cut for budget reasons back in 1995 when our uh, national debt was a resounding $5 trillion, and we would love to be there today now, of course. Um, on the other hand, we do have very real scientific challenges, especially as we uh, consider uh, the global threats that we face um, and, and need to ensure that we're able to, to meet those challenges for our, our nation. Um, I was wondering, uh, Mr. McCord, could you uh, could you kind of recap some of the resources that are available to us as congressmen? And one of you. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, the primary resources that we looked at in the study are, are support agencies, Congressional Research Service, not represented here today, which tends to do the shorter turnaround. Uh, taskers from Congress, and then the Government Accountability Office, which is really the, the, the main heavy hitter in the field today, th that is something that is, that is under the control of the legislative branch. We're well aware that there's many resources out there, the National Academy. I, I worked on the Hill for 24 years uh, before my time right. at Beauty. My, my boss was deluge with, with books that people would come by to give him on, on topics of every imaginable subject. I have a stack subject. on my desk as well. Um, so we, yeah. we, uh, uh, to Dr. Manley referred to this, uh, the most, or I think, the most advised body. Or, or, so we recognize that there's the outside resources. Uh, that you have to assess whether someone has an ax to grind that makes you question their input uh, in addition right. to the to the scientific community. What I think was driving our, our recommendation for an advisor and perhaps also the, the interest in re re recreating OTA is that there should be somebody that, that is responsible only to you, that is, that is a voice, that is a coordinator that, uh, you know, that you can trust. So, Right now you have... Uh, it seems uh, to me, though, that, that, I mean, and this has been touched on, but that the greatest challenge isn't the amount of information. It's the uh, ability to triage yes. and get uh, helpful and effective information for decision-making. Mm -hmm. um, and so I appreciate the fact that the, the conversation has kind of been geared that way a little bit. I mean, we have the leading scientists, access to them across the whole country. We had Bruce Banner in here the other day, you know, so um, it's, we have access to people, but the question for me is how do we get effective information to, to people? Now, I'm, I'm, uh, we've been talking about the fact of a bipartisan effort here. Uh, I think the better term is nonpartisan, of course, when we're talking about science, because really the data should, should lead it, not one party or both parties. Um, but I don't have a whole lot of confidence that necessarily putting that within the legislative branch um, produces that. I indeed, in the past, reports were often taken too long and some were withheld by the chair of the committee and, and not given access to the rest of Congress. And so I'm wondering if you, in your proposal that you, do you have any recommendations that address those issues? We certainly agree that, that you need unbiased, you know, nonpartisan advice that you can trust. When we talk about putting, uh, for example, adding an advisor to key committees, not to this committee, of course, this committee is a little bit of, a, of an exception in terms of already having the capable, you know, expertise on this issue, but on other committees, um, we don't, certainly don't, do not advocate having Democratic advisors and Republican advisors. Uh, that would be, I think, we'd be very, very much regret if that's the road that, you know, someone ended up going down. But we do think that the committees, that produce the legislation don't have enough capability. Uh, Mr. Byerford, of course, the even even greater challenge in a personal office, uh, and it is my experience that I think it's probably unavoidable that organizations like GAO or an advisor, if you follow our recommendation, or OTA, if you create OTA, they're going to have to prioritize and probably put committee requests first, unless there's a really large investment in capability. Um, I think that's going to be a fact of life. but. On the, the the team that you do have does have to be uh, does have to be nonpartisan. 
And I started my I career. I wanted to get I, one more question in for sorry. Mr. Pearsons. Um, you've been producing reports in the GAO, and uh, my understanding is you've been able to get them to us a lot quicker. Previously, you know, when they would take a year or two, sometimes we'd get a request for a report, it wouldn't be to the next Congress, uh, completely different people making the decisions to, to get that uh, information. Um, and so you've been able to do that much quicker. Is that is that true? Could you speak to that? Yes, thank you for the question. Thanks for the compliment, Mr. Cloud. We uh, are working on cycle times uh, to get down to um, several weeks for the single pagers that you have in your packet, the S&T spotlights, which are just brief 101s on a technology, up to an intermediate scale, which is uh, about a six month, uh, six to nine month turnaround descriptive only, and then up to uh, 12 to 18 months uh, in doing that. Uh, we do have that advantage of our congressional protocols and our extensive review process. We think we can have the quality and still meet the operational tempo. And that is part of, for the new science tech assessment and analytics team, our strategies be content focused, not just deliver report per se, even though, as the studies rightly point out independently with Belfer and Napa, that there's still the need for uh, the larger studies, but there's also the need for this agility to reach out and also be proactive to, to essentially say, Congress, you haven't asked for this yet, but we're seeing something that's coming and we just want you to know about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Castor. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, for totally selfish reasons, I want to thank you all for coming today. I am I, I think I can say this with confidence, but one needs to be careful about superlatives in this line of work. I think I am the only member of Congress as a freshman who made a campaign promise before getting elected to restore the OTA. Um, I'm sure that's why I won. <laughs> it really resonates in the district. The, the reason for that um, is, is somewhat personal. When I got out of, out of graduate school with a master's in biochemical engineering in 97, I went to work for Arthur D. Little. And this was in the day the internet was coming around, but we still had a corporate library that we had to use to do all our research. Um, and the, whether we were looking at hydrogen storage technology or advances in bio battery technology or biomass gasification technology, we had this whole volume of OTA reports that we would go to look at, not to tell us about will the technology work, but what are the theoretical limits that you can get to in this technology? If it did work, you know, with 100% efficiency, what would it get to? So you can kind of backdoor what's what makes sense. I have and, a CD for you. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Microfiche, please. Um, the, but as I'm sitting there, this is 90, 98, 99, I'm noticing that they all sort of stop around, I think, 94, 95-ish. And I said to my boss, you know, where's the section of the library where I find the rest of these reports? And my boss sort of chuckled and he said, he said, well, uh, good news, bad news. Bad news is Gingrich killed the OTA. Good news is we get to sell a lot more consulting services now because what used to be free to the public, you now got to pay for. What the government used to get from OTA, they now had to hire us. So we did a lot of work for DOE and EPA and USDA doing all this analysis. And so... So I have the very lived experience that dropping the OTA didn't save the government a dime. Probably cost more, because my billing hour rates were a lot higher than what the OTA charged. Um, but it probably made us dumber, because now you could only get that information if you could afford to pay for it. And it made us ever more dependent on, on lobbyists for the information. Now, since getting elected, I love what GAO does. I love what CRS does. It is fundamentally not synthetic. It is a report of what's out there in the existing literature. And when I want to go and find out what are the thermodynamic limits, the way I answer that question now is I hire good staff. So I have staff that I've hired onto my team who have degrees in engineering and biostatistics and math. That is not the typical congressional staff. And the, the fact that we now have to go and do that with staff from what used to be provided elsewhere is a glaring hole. And I would reiterate, we didn't save any money. We just got dumber. And you know, back in Illinois, we had you know, that future gen project, huge carbon capture sequestration. With a master's degree in the back of a napkin, you could have proved that that was inanely stupid and would never work. We spent four billion federal dollars to prove what you could prove on the back of a napkin. So as you might imagine, I am a bit concerned, Mr. McCord, about the Napa conclusions. And when Mr. Lucas, I believe, asked you, 
your, your answer was mostly about the political reasons why you thought this was best in GAO. Leave, leave us to sort out the politics. Are there non-political reasons why the Napa report concluded that the OTA, from a scientific perspective, given my experience, why there shouldn't be a recreation of the OTA? Uh, thank you for that question. I would say that our, our panel consensus was that a more modest approach was more likely to succeed. So, but but that, that's a political conclusion, though. I'm, I'm asking, leave all the politics aside. I, I want to know, let's focus on what's necessary, and then we can deal with what's politically possible. What I want is for us not to be dumber. Is there a reason why not creating the OTA, as not recreating the OTA, would be scientifically useful? Again, I... I, I I don't think we would agree with the characterization that it's a political judgment, but, but again, looking at something has failed to happen for 25 years, you can have something that's incredibly desirable that people aren't willing to pay for, and you have nothing at the end of that, and that's kind of where we, we sit today with respect to an OTA. So it, again, we, did not, we do not oppose the creation or recreation or refunding of OTA, but we think that a better way to get there would be to follow this approach of creating an advisory office that is somewhat smaller that coordinates what's already being done with Dr. Person's okay. office and being done at CRS and see then if you need more. You can always move in that direction to see if you need more. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm basically out of time. Ms. Manley, do you have any reasons why from a non-political basis? Just, just a yes or no because I know I'm out of time. Non-politically, are there reasons not to create the OTA? No. Dr. Blair? Okay, Dr. Persons, I'm going to leave you off on that. I, I just want to close with this. I just got back from the, I just got back from the Madrid conference. If the justification for not creating the OTA is that 20, in 25 years we haven't found the political will, in 25 years we haven't found the political will to get serious about climate change. That is no reason for inaction. This is a much smaller problem. Let's do it. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Walls. Thank you, Madam Chair. Panel, thank you so much uh, for coming today. I'm, I'm interested in, and just want to talk to you for a moment about the networking gap that you identified uh, in the report. And I just want to echo my colleague, Mr. Cloud. I don't think there's a, a dearth of information out there. It's just really a debate of how to access it, how to triage it, and make it useful for decision makers and policy makers. Uh, I represent Florida's sixth congressional district in central and northeast Florida, and the district that I'm in has is home to several universities, uh, including Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, Stetson University, Bethune-Cookman, and others, and they're, they really are doing phenomenal work, much of it federally supported, in paving the way for research and development in science and technology. And the Napa report identified a gap in networking uh, in the networking support category, which the, you know, basically the, the report defined as assisting Congress in gaining access to outside uh, S&T experts. So, Mr. McCord, what, what do you see as preventing Congress from fully accessing and utilizing these important uh, critical academic experts as a resource for us? Um, well, as, as has been noted, uh, you, you, your institution gets a lot of input, yeah. um, and you have to then filter whether or not uh, you, you think that it's got you know too much of a, of a, of a personal interest to grind, axe to grind on when it comes in. On the networking side, I think we, we felt that if you had this advisory office that we talk about, someone that would be the face of science and technology for the Hill, that they would be able to do a coordinating function to be a, a a face that people could reach out to and an ombudsman for an office like yours to go to say, I'm, I'm having trouble getting the information I need. Can you help me get in touch with the right people? Um, rather than have you, it's not to say that you wouldn't have a workaround. You probably do since, since that, the thing we're talking about doesn't exist. Perhaps you go to GAO and CRS separately and say, can you help me? Or perhaps you reach out to someone you know and trust, you know, someone like Dr. Blair who's outside the legislative branch entirely what we think this coordinating this office could do, though, is, again, to be more of the, of the, the face of science and technology and, and an ombudsman to help you with these problems. 
Thank you, Ms. Panley. Anything, would you add anything to that? Um, it, it's related, but I'd, I'd actually like to just get this on the record. Um, speaking only for myself personally, uh, a lot of this conversation has been about um, how we would bolster GAO and some of the other support agencies. But um, from my experience working with large bureaucracies and inside of them, it is very difficult to change an institution from within, especially culturally. And um, from my work with, with tech startups, some of the most successful ones are the ones that deeply understand users from the start and can design from the ground up exactly what's needed. So a lot of this conversation has been focused on what's happened in the past and whether or not it was political or whether or not it was extremely useful and saved lots of dollars. But I think we've all acknowledged here that if we were to reinstate an OTA, it would be vastly different completely different from the past. So I just want to get that on the record to say that it isn't a completely absurd idea to do that, but I do think it needs to be done in, in combination with GAO. Thank you, and, and just in the interest of time, looking over the horizon, I mean, looking at long-term trends rather than the kind of the, you know, the immediate requests, how would that office or how would the advisor do that versus what GAO and what CRS is currently able to do? Uh, would that be a specific mandate? I mean, I'm really interested in looking at, you know, decades out trends that, that we can start absorbing and hopefully uh, begin legislating towards. Uh, thank you. Well, in, in the panel's view, that th this office, especially at the beginning, would not have the capacity to do all of that itself. It probably would need to go out and contract with other people and work with other people, including at GAO and probably including the National Academies of Sciences also. And uh, it, from my background uh, in the defense world, it was routine to have uh, witnesses come in at the start of the year. Director of National Intelligence comes in and does, here's what I see. Uh, combatant commanders from around the different geographic parts of the world do the same. So it's kind of that model of people, people that have that broad view come in and tell you what they see, and the horizon can be, you know, whatever you, the members, do you, do you want five years, do you want 10 years, do you want 20? That'd be something for, for this committee and others to kind of give direction to. Similarly, I think you would want to decide, do you want them to look at, here are the big developments in science and technology that we see, or here are the big developments that we see where public policy is farthest behind. So you could have, again, that would be something that we would kind of leave to you to decide what do you want that horizon scanning function to be. Thank you, and thank you all for coming today. Madam thank Chair, you. I yield. Thank you. Mr. Lamb. Um, thank you all for being here. I, I think this is a really important topic. I'm, I'm kind of struggling with it a little bit because it's, um, the conversation is, is at, a, at a pretty abstract level, you know, that generally what types of advice Congress should get and from who. Um, is there a way maybe we could go down the line? I don't know who wants to start. Ms. Manley was kind of um, where I got this thought. But, you know, members of Congress are not just here kind of um, thinking up ideas and what to work on every day, like philosopher kings or something. We're very responsive to our constituents and the problems that they have and the things that they bring our t to our attention. So. Is there a way that maybe you could each specify a problem that we are trying to solve here in the lives of our everyday constituents? And I think, Ms. Manley, you mentioned a little bit about data privacy and elections and that kind of thing. But is there a way for you to put it in those terms, that um, better scientific and, and technology advice here in the institution of Congress? What's an example of a specific problem we might be able to solve that an average constituent of mine is going through? Sure. I, I think a, a perfect example where there's sort of a war of experts is on what to do about the big tech companies. A lot of experts, even within Harvard, will say, we should break up the tech companies. Other folks would say, that would be disastrous. So I think having an independent expert body that could really weigh in with all of the different options would be incredibly valuable. It's not something that individual offices could, could really take a look at comprehensively. So that's a prime example of, of where this expertise is, is really, really needed in a time-sensitive way. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good example. Um, and even within your example, there are those who say some companies should be broken up and not others, like they wouldn't even treat that as one category. I guess my observation is that um, 
I don't even think we're anywhere close to a consensus existing in the American public that that's one of the highest priority problems that an average middle class, working class person faces. Um, you may be able to draw those connections in the classroom, but uh, in the real world, I don't think that consensus exists yet. So does anyone have anything to say about the way that better or more contemporaneous scientific advice could address something, um, you know, say related to the workforce or working conditions or salaries or consumer buying power, things that, that really people are going through on a day to day. Go ahead, Dr. Persons. Yes, thanks, Mr. Lamb. Appreciate it. And I think uh, I'll just mention two, but they are related. I, I mentioned earlier in my remarks about just the uh, the burgeoning or the unfolding of uh, 5G wireless and the impacts there. Lots of opportunities for that technology, you know, exponentiating our bandwidth and things. But it's at risk for creating a have and have nots narrative in terms of if you're middle class working, is that something that's going to be for urban dense core areas only, or will it be available to the middle class or even especially in the rural areas, some of which don't even have 3G yet. So uh, that's that. The second thing is with respect to machine learning and artificial intelligence, again, a key thing under the leadership of this committee, there's been some great work on and apparently some draft legislation, but that has a lot of impacts on what's the impact on the workforce. I think the, uh, the key thing is that uh, it's not clear, as we reported in our 2018 report, that it's, it's the job apocalypse, as I'll say. It's not going to eliminate all jobs, but there's going to be a disruption in terms of certain types of jobs. And it's still somewhat of a predictive thing. We'll be wrong in one sense, but less wrong if we're not doing this foresight tech assessment type work that's necessary in this scientific advisory body way. But we're sort of the frog being boiled slowly in the water on machine learning systems, and that's why GAO is doing this foresight work as well as we're doing uh, tactically, we're working on and synthetically uh, working on a machine learning uh, algorithms and looking at accountability for that because you're going to see it in things where, uh, let's suppose a federal agency may have a hiring system and they implement a machine learning algorithm to filter and sort on job applicants. How do we know, for example, that that algorithm, even if it's uh, purchased off the shelf from a software company, is compliant with the Civil Rights Act of 1964? So it's that kind of thing where we're moving in a statistical computing world that's necessary for things like uh, what we're talking about here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's almost like it's almost like having interpreters. I mean, it's almost like this technology presents an entirely different language um, in which we have to think in order to make rules. Uh, and with that, Madam Chairwoman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, Madam Mr. Chair. Mr. Foster is, is recognized for well, you know, Thank you, and um, um, thank you very much. I really appreciate this, this opportunity to finish up on some of the things. I guess the thing that I feel most strongly about is, uh, Dr. Persons, I, I just, I didn't have a chance to compliment you enough on, on the work that you're doing inside GAO. It is, it is important to reconfigure yourself to meet this. You know, I've been trying, uh, working very hard with a number of my colleagues to try to get the OTA resurrected. Our odds of success are not 100%. And as I said before, I think we need an, uh, you know, all of the above approach here because of the importance of this. Um, and you know, I think the other, the other thing that I, I muse about frequently is the fact that we simply don't have on staff. You know, what you really want to do as a member, if you see something, um, a story in the press, you say, hey, is that garbage or not? Is that a real issue, um, you know, an issue for my constituents or for my district or for our country, or is that just sort of hype? And so if there's someone that you have right at hand that you trust, you know, if OTA was sort of enmeshed in Congress so that you, are there are several people that you would know on a first name basis, call them up and say, hey, is this garbage or not? Um, that, that would, that's sort of the dream. Um, ultimately, the be, that's the sort of help that you get uh, from your staff. Um, and another one of the sources of frustration I think was uh, discussed in the, in the, um, the Belfer report is that we, Congress doesn't have the ability to absorb the information uh, at the rate. Even though there are lots of reports that, that could be read, we simply don't have the ability to absorb. And, and so one of my questions, what are the ideas that are out there to provide um, high quality, sort of long term you know, and not, not rotators or, or temporary uh, fellowships and stuff, but people who make their career um, as science advisors close at hand to Congress. Um, do, any, any ideas on what's yeah, been tried there? Yeah. Dr. Player? Resurrecting ancient history, I think, uh, 
in the OTA experience, uh, one of the sort of quiet uh, resources that the agency provided that I think is aspirational for all the groups that we're talking about here was what George Brown and, um, and Ted Stevens, former chairs of that board, referred to as the shared staff. And that is in the OTA experience when a major assessment was done in a particular area, that expertise was then available for all the committees and, and often individual members' offices to become really an authoritative resource in that area. And so I think as the body of, of expertise develops in whatever mechanism is, is uh, developed, making as a high priority the availability of those staff to serve both as shared staff for the committees and members' offices, but also as the Rolodex for identifying resources outside the Congress that can be a benefit uh, across the board. So I think that's a mechanism that's important to keep in mind. And sir, I just point to, just from a, a capacity thing at GAO, as you know, again, 70 FTEs, we, we've, we've hit that mark we had targeted for FY19 in terms of permanent hires. They are available to Congress now. Uh, again, our, our only, uh, our design of this is to be proactive, so the only burden Congress has to have is just ask the question. And then at times there will be questions that we might not be able to answer immediately or in a fulsome way, but then it becomes a risk management discussion about what work might need to be done. But uh, when you look at the Belfer Center report, page 6263, about the ideal system with this, existing with the Congress, Congress, convening groups of stakeholders, serving congressional needs, options oriented, that implies a permanent staff, which is what we have, as well as this uh, scale and reach out to not only national academies, but other external experts. A final thing that we're doing is in addition to the AAAS Fellows Program and the Tech Congress Fellows, all of which I think adds to or supports the absorptive narrative that uh, you're hearing from Belfort and Napa, uh, we also send staff on details from GAO. Uh, and we want to uh, be able to be embedded where uh, that's possible. In fact, this committee now has one of the SDAA staff with it at the moment. Uh, we've had previous staffers on the Hill. It's something that we do because we're passionate about pushing out and serving you uh, in a nonpartisan, fact-based, agile manner. Yes, Ms. Manley. Uh, I think another way to, to think about addressing this S&T gap is the role of universities. Um, our follow-up report from this recent one is to understand current pathways for STEM talent to, to serve on Capitol Hill, um, which universities have created effective pathways and how can we scale those. So I think it's, it's up to universities to make sure that understanding policy is not just something that the policy schools do, and it's something that's integrated into other types of curriculum like law and engineering and mathematics. Thank you. And I guess I, I also can't close this discussion without just saying we, we have to do something somehow to figure out how to raise the level of staff salaries uh, so that we can have, a, you know, this be a viable career. You know, we're about to, to lose in my office uh, Susanna Howison there, who um, handles our science committee work here, uh, we'd have to like double the salary that, that we could offer her to be able to keep her compared to the offers here. And you know, as someone with a young family in, in DC area, you know, they, you're constrained. And this is, this is a problem. I don't know how to fix it. And I think if any of us ran for re-election with a platform of doubling staff salaries, I don't think we would last very long. Uh, but I think we should at least scale our salaries with, say, the median income in the United States. Um, well, thank you. And you'll thank all of you for your, your attention to this idea. And yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, before we bring the hearing to a close, I want to thank our witnesses for testifying before the committee today and to say that the record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from the members and for any additional questions the committee might ask of the witnesses. The witness is now excused and the hearing is now adjourned. <laughs>